Hi. Hello and welcome to Mage Talk. I'm joined today by the king of the Magento New York scene himself, Mayer Bianchi, CEO of B Meyer, uh, Magento agency out there in, in uh, New York. How you doing, sir? Good. Doing great today. Solid. Happy to be here. Yeah. Finally. Yeah, finally. It's been a long time coming. It's uh it's good to finally finally get this thing going. Um, how's it going out out in uh, out in New York? Okay, so it's been an interesting last. You six live months. in Jersey though now, right? Yeah, so I recently relocated to the burbs or out of the city. My man after sold out years. after 35 years and moved to the burbs. Yep, I lived in Brooklyn in a 10 block radius of where I was born, and then. Uh, you know, now I live like an hour away in New Jersey, and it's a whole other ball game. I have a space, own property. Uh, you know, it's a it's a different uh, it's Got a different a new vibe. house, so, right? Yeah. Congratulations. So yeah, yeah. So that was big because now you know, building equity, building Straight generational up. wealth, or yep. at least not paying That's someone right. else's mortgage is, That's is right. key. That's right. right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Nice. And man. so in New York. Yeah, and so about New York, uh, it's definitely bouncing back. I go back to Brooklyn sometimes. I was there last weekend. And there's a vibrant scene on, you know, certain main thoroughfares, people, because all the restaurants are outside. I wonder what it'd be like in the winter because there's no indoor dining. But for example, you can eat in like the backyard of a restaurant or they have all these tables in the street set up in the front. And so everybody's like creating really outdoor dining stuff now. Like they're like they're adding sidewalks and stuff like everybody's. Yeah, just... like it became like Europe, but like a budget version of Europe because it's literally wooden <laughs> sheds in the gutter. Like they built these wooden boxes in the gutter or put tents up in the gutter and took over parking spots right. or some of it's on the sidewalk. So it's like definitely a interesting thing to see, but it's cool it just is like I don't know. I'm just has, I'm just nervous because one day I don't want to hear about the like the car that drove through some outdoor dining area, you know? Right. So, yeah. Yeah. God forbid. But no, it's but like yeah, in a, in, a, in a hot minute overnight, it became a budget version of Europe, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least that's what this summer's flavor is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. people are partying in the street. Like there's like I haven't you know I I didn't go to like Williamsburg or certain areas where it's really live but like you know there's blocks where everyone's outside and just wilding kind of out festive. Yeah. yeah like it's summer right plus people were cooped up so there's different outlets people are seeking like back in April Prospect Park which is like the main park in Brooklyn like akin to Central Park designed by the same people it uh it was packed like you know during the initial phase of the pandemic like it was like you couldn't turn a corner or go anywhere without being like having to try to figure out how to stay six feet away from somebody even right. on like the back trails yeah. but but yeah so i mean the city's healthy but from an economic standpoint you do hear about a lot of businesses closing a lot of places that didn't make it or food establishments and stuff like that right so i think it's still very much like we shall see and also with the winter and you know whatever's coming it's interesting so yeah. it, it gave me a good feeling to see life and that brooklyn was healthy but at the same time interesting to see what comes next yeah yeah, winter is going to be interesting to see what happens. You know, you, you know the uh, generally flus and type deals spike in the winter as well, and so yeah, dude, yep. it's going to get a little gnarly, you know. But um, but so you uh you have a couple meetups out there, right? You've got the is it the Brooklyn Magento meetup? You got a yep. Shopify meetup. You got all sorts of meetups now, right? Yeah, so the meetup game went like this. Uh, I saw an opportunity, I think back in 2017 or so, to uh, found the Brooklyn Magento meetup because the New York meetup was meeting kind of infrequently. Meetups are, in essence, really hard to do now. And now that I've done them, I realize why they're hard to put on all the time. But basically, we have four meetups. We have the Brooklyn Magento meetup, the Brooklyn Shopify meetup, the Brooklyn Big Commerce meetup, and the Orange County, California Magento meetup. So <laughs> that's like out of Orange, nowhere, <laughs> like New York. Yeah, that's New because York, I New have York, associates that I work with yeah. and colleagues in Orange County. And Orange County is like just like how Brooklyn is like a second giant city right next to New Manhattan. Right. Orange County is like a big hotbed of economic stuff right near in tech, right near L.A. So it's another opportunity that's funny. that we're looking for. I never yeah. quite thought of it that way, but that makes sense. It's like the Brooklyn of L.A. pretty much. Sort of. Yeah. With less, like in terms of at least another flavor. Major. A little bit less flavor. Yeah. Right? yeah, it's definitely different. You know the deal because you're from over there. But yeah. yeah Orange so. County is like heaven. It's just like, you know, yeah. it's like no crime. Everybody's happy. You know, it's like a little version yeah, of San Diego. 
Yeah, it depends what part. That's depends the what other part. part of the U.S. that I've spent the most time because when I was working in uh, Weed Maps, I spent a lot of time in Irvine and um, learned a bit about the area and like Laguna and Newport and uh, Anaheim and, you know, the whole dynamic there. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that I, did, I glossed over the whole Brooklyn meetup thing. If you want to hear the story of the, the Brooklyn meetup, yeah. it's just like this is an opportunity to found a meetup in a city that is underrepresented. Brooklyn's 4 million people. Uh, it, it has enough of a tech and like business community that there could be a Magento meetup. And so there's like, you know, Laura Falco, Eric Heilman, certain key Magento community members are located in shout there. Shout out to Laura. Yeah, yeah. yeah, big shout out to them. And uh, and then it was cool because I used to have an office in this co-working space called the Bond Collective. It was actually on an episode of uh, Broad City once, but uh, it's like a, you know, it's like an independent style WeWork type of deal. And so they had a cool like conference room and hosting space. So that was easy to, to host meet up there. And like we got a, a small turnout the first time, but then like did a, did a few of them and it always had some, you always had something interesting, right? And, and my meetups were different because we didn't do like the whole speaker thing. It was more like a round table. Like I said, hey, everyone's coming and they're missing dinner. So let's serve dinner, right? Everybody have some food. Let's uh, talk about what's going on at work. Let's talk about certain topics, like a round table discussion. And then that's also where at the time I was trying to heavily promote the whole sponsor dev thing and try to like, um, you know, do some good in the community. So just try to like create a movement. And I would just say consistency is key. And that's where I've obviously struggled in recent years as you focus your budget on different things or your time or, you know, so it's like meetups are really interesting. Right. But then the Brooklyn Shopify meetup had like 40 people and like the Shopify meetup in terms of interest level was really big. So that was a surprise and also really cool to meet a whole different segment of people. Like I got to meet Octane AI before they like, right as they were growing. And it was interesting to meet the founders and there was all these cool people from different companies. That sounds really and, familiar. What is the, what do they do Octane? They're a, a chat bot messenger. Okay. Shout out to Ben Parr. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a chat bot and they're like one of the leading apps on Shopify now for that. Mm. And they've been pretty successful. And so that was just a taste of like, wow, Shopify has a whole different world going on here. And then with the New York meetup, the coolest meetup we ever did was this joint meetup with Kimberly Thomas's meetup and Laura's meetup in the city. And uh, shout out to Danny Vercade, uh, who came in, who was in from the Netherlands. It was at this company called Stadium Goods. They're a shoe company that was doing some interesting project with Cream. And we got their space and it was like this cool rooftop hosting situation. And so that was like a nice turnout, like 40 people, summertime, rooftop meetup was awesome. Had different speakers. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, and we had a gentleman from Argentina who I feel really bad because his name is slipping my mind right now because we've been spoken in a while. I could look it up in a minute, but he was kind of the catalyst because he was coming in. And he's like, hey, I'm coming in for the summer. And I want to do a meetup. And then, oh, like, it was I remember he hosts that. Argentina yeah, meetup. Yeah, I remember this. this or he hosts the Buenos Aires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was cool because he, uh, I'm just going to find his name because I feel guilty. Uh, Dude, for sure. But basically, you got to get that on the record. Yeah. Dude, but I'm basically, gonna, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm going to have Danny on the pod uh, in a couple weeks, actually. So that should be yeah, cool. Yeah, Frederico Soyage, by the way. Oh, Frederico. Okay. So yeah, he's oh, yeah, man. yeah, 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 yeah. His wife was really nice too. Nice. Yeah, That's he's cool. based in Argentina and uh, you know, and Brazil. He has the meetups there. So nice. That, yeah, and so he that was really cool because it was an international confluence of Magento meetups and like an example of Magento community coming together, developers, agencies, businesses. So that was I would feel like the history of the meetups. And then, you know, I definitely have been on a meetup hiatus and literally. In March of 2020, the OC meetup was about to go down. We had the date picked out. It was on my birthday. It was going to be like a good omen. And we were working with uh, John When's your birthday? Johnson. What day is your birthday? Uh, March. March. In the middle of March. Right. Around okay. between okay. the 10th and 20th. You <laughs> okay. know. Got um, it. Don't, uh, don't want to and, share uh, too many identifying details. That's true. Yeah, so that's good. That's good. Yeah, my social that was a test. Yeah. That was a test yeah. of your security capabilities. So you passed. Yeah. You passed. Yeah, I mean, you still gave away the ten day range. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but um, but yeah, we were gonna throw it, and Vertex was down to sponsor, and we had I think someone from Dot Digital coming because there's all this base of partners on the West Coast, and my company Bumeyer, we're partnered with a lot of the top tech partners. And so that was one of the things we wanted to try to leverage was like, 
you know, building rapport. But then, of course, coronavirus happened. And so we put that on hold. And so I predicted that there'd be a lot of virtual meetups. And I'm still interested to see how that shakes out because really I could decide tomorrow I'm having a virtual meetup tonight at nine, throw up a Zoom link, whoever wants to come. Like you'd have a meetup every day. Yeah. So the barrier for virtual meetups is way lower, I think. Yeah. So it's like I'm wondering like what's going to take for me to do them because now there's really nothing stopping you, right? I don't have to pay for drinks. I don't have to pay for space. Yeah. There's no, there's way less cost associated. Yeah. They're also, but like in a way they're like sort of like not as meaningful if it's just a, it, like you have to work so hard uh, with an online event, like to, to try to recreate the sense of connection that you get when you're in person, yeah. you know, exactly. I feel like there's going to be some like breakthrough innovations at some point on how to do that. Cause it's just like, it's just not the same currently. You know, yeah, the soft the software they used for that last Magento conference that happened online was the closest thing I've ever seen to something that could kind of create breakout rooms. And like there's a central location where everybody's chatting, but then you can go into this room and have a side combo. But then the talks are going on over here. So it really felt like Meet Magento New York, for example, shout out again to Mage Mojo, where they are. Uh, you know, like people may not go into the, t the talk because they're doing the hallway track. Right. And I think in a virtual meetup, there's no way to have a side combo, right? I can't be like, okay, let's go go outside and have a beer and talk over here because you seem to know about this shipping problem I'm having and I don't really care what they're saying. Like, you can't do that virtually because then you're going to be DMing someone like, hey, can I get your number? And it's like, I don't know you, you know, like it's going to be a very different uh, experience. You know, it's hard to like build that trust or, uh, you know, just the ease up moments where the group goes into individual conversation versus the focused, bigger yeah. kumbaya yeah 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 totally like to me it's all about the hallway track you know and it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah it's like it's hard to kind of recreate that but it, but and i didn't check out that magenta one but i think you were saying or somebody was saying that they did a good job of allowing you to kind of mingle a little bit in little specific rooms mm -hmm. and stuff like that so yeah i gotta get the name of that software because i think that was like the most successful example i've seen of that like because yeah, probably for example expensive. the shopify unite yeah <laughs> for the shopify unite that was happening at the time was not like that. It was more of a stream, you know? So I would say like they were on the same day, but the Magento software they were using was really cool because yeah. it created that. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you touched on uh, some of the sponsorships and stuff you've done. I thought was, I've always thought that was real cool, real generous um, of you. You've done, like you sponsor tickets to like hackathons. I, I want to say tickets to Imagine as well. No, that would be too oh, baller. Okay, I wish okay, I did that. Mind. I wish I had to like fly somebody in to imagine, but but yeah, no. So it Imagine's started. Expensive, uh, man. Imagine is too yeah, expensive. Yeah. I'm the one trying to be like, oh, I didn't get a discount. Like you know, I can't believe I didn't ask this guy for the discount. Barely trying, barely spend. getting in ourselves, right? What do you got to pay? Yeah, for the exactly. Up? Yeah, and and uh, but no. So that whole initiative, I I want to say I started it in 2017 again because that's when i really transitioned from like singular freelance mentality to more going to an agency mindset and like really a uh, caution to the wind and um i went to mage titans right in uk shout out to john woodall and the space 48 crew yeah uh that yep. was a really awesome experience because i'd never been to manchester before and saw that the uk magento community and how they operated and so i remember at the time he was generous enough to like either I didn't go on stage, but like we basically gave away five Magento certifications or we, I was trying to give like, what I was trying to do was this thing called sponsor dev, where I noticed that people didn't believe in themselves to get Magento certifications and to put up the couple hundred dollars right. that like, that's right. you know, and this was pre Joseph Maxwell or at the same time, maybe he, I can't say I can't claim full inception, but it was right before that. And so the idea was that you kind of need someone for accountability. You kind of need someone to hold you responsible or tell you, hey, I believe in you enough to go get the sponsorship, to go get the, the certification. certification. And so that's where I was like, if people who wouldn't normally do it win a, a coupon to do it, maybe that helps them remove their, um, what's the word, like hesitation or their, uh, you know, their, like helps add confidence that, hey, it's okay if hump. I fail. Right? Yeah, I didn't, yeah, 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 exactly. And so cool, it worked. Man. I mean, I ended up sponsoring a Magento master, who I would say is someone who didn't act, may not need it, but it was cool to be a part of his story. Uh, there was a, a few people in Italy, and it was really cool. So the idea was to inspire, through my acts, bigger companies to try to do the same thing. And I started to know it's a trend. Like, I know Swift Otter was doing it, and he became, like, certification lord. So I think 
that was really cool to see that happen after whether, you know, I don't, I think indirectly, at least m myself was noticed. So I'm saying like the whole idea of um, sponsoring was just trying to be like, hey, if my small company can contribute in these ways, what can bigger companies do that can have an even bigger impact? And so it was just trying to create a conversation. And I think we also sponsored Meet Magento India in 2018. Um, That's right. Obviously uh, sponsored Meet Magento New York. Shout out uh, to There was Brent. a cool conference called... Yes, Brent, exactly. And um, I didn't actually make it in VJ. Didn't, didn't actually make it to that one, but it was cool to see our stuff there. And someone I worked with named Harpreet Singh, he met with Eric and Marsha. Eric and Marsha. So like it was cool to see like the worlds unite, right? Like people that, sim you know, like someone that I had wanted to meet in person, meet people that I didn't know. So at least bridge the gap. And so with the whole sponsorship thing, it was like kind of like me just trying to get the name out there in an asymmetric way. And then also there's a conference called Fashion Digital that uh, Sandy Hussein was putting on. And that was one of my proudest moments because we got sponsored and there's this like leaderboard of us next to like BVXL, IBM, like, you know, and then there's Be Meyer logo. It's on the Instagram, like just right there next to all these big corps. And nice. I was like, wow. <laughs> and so like that was cool. And then, you know, but ultimately like uh, the sponsoring stuff is something that I haven't done as much lately, right? When you go through a phase of a lot of company building or other concerns, like, you know, staff scaling and like more, you know, we just got really busy, right? Like in 2018 is when business started to pick up in the end of 2018. And so a lot of the the marketing and other stuff I was doing kind of got turned down in 2019 and like, and, and so it's been quiet, right? I did all this stuff with the fashion and the merch and trying to be out there like, creating an identity, like the hats, hats right? I went yeah. to a match and gave everyone hats. And I thought it was working. It was just hard to do at scale. Because that's what led me to it, right? Like I first went to Lids during the conference, ran to Lids and was producing all these hats in the middle of Imagine, running around Vegas. That was the first year. And then I found out about Printful because I was like, I don't want to inventory hats. So print on demand. And so that gave me a taste of print on demand integration for Shopify. Printful, Printful is wild, man. They're, they have awesome. Yeah, they awesome. have sane functionality and stuff. Um, yeah, they could do, I and believe, integration. yeah, lots of integrations. I believe they could do custom embroidered hats. Actually, I had them do, a. a that's why I did it. Yeah. That's why you did it. Yeah, yeah. I think they're the only ones that, that can do, uh, do that specifically as well as probably a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. 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 I and, remember I prototyped one for you for like Thomas Hero also. I was making, I was playing around with the logos. Yeah. Dude, I feel like I forgot about, I, I got to I gotta take another look at that, dude. I, it's foggy. Yeah, I didn't actually send it, so. Oh, okay. It, wasn't, it was like more just like color. It's not um, like I sent you a gift. It just yeah, it was digital. Don't worry. Nice, yeah. nice. Um, yeah, but you were saying that you were you were ramping up the swag and all that kind of stuff, and then, um, and then got busy and stuff. Um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. Um, we were gonna talk about just in general, like what's it like to grow an agency you know, everybody's remote now. You've been remote. Uh, I believe you've had some remote team members for a while. Um, you know, what's that yeah, like I've been for you guys? Remote for five years. Okay. So you have yeah, a real head start. Of remote. Yeah. So you got a real head start. Yeah. So probably for you, it's been like no big deal. Like, no, like I'd imagine. I would say it was, the, yeah, it was quarantine training. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. We all been in quarantine training for years now. So, um, yeah. So like what, um, I mean, it's such a big topic, like growing an agency, growing your business, um, how, um, I don't know, like, what would you say on that topic? Like, how's, how's that, how's that been for you? What, what advice would you give to people starting out? You know? Okay. Um, that was a vague so question. Yeah, I mean, that was a very vague question. Yeah, so I mean, I would just start with something a wise man once told me, which is accounting, 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 okay. finance, 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 business plan. I didn't always listen to him, right? But at the same time, like the foundation of knowing where your business is at is the key, right? Like in terms of uh, profit and you know costs and just how you're planning to grow your business. And then my experience has been different in the sense that I never actually worked at an agency in my life, right? So I started out doing freelancing after I left the job where I was at, and then because of a, a relationship with a vendor, I got introduced to a new client, and then I ended up working for them exclusively for a while, maybe had one little client. So it was kind of like first, that was my first taste of remote life. And so 
I would say that like I learned about more agile practices and stuff that agencies do from an outward perspective. So I would say I, I don't I always operated from the owner's mindset, right? That's what's different about my company versus other agencies I might have seen or worked with is that like I never came from the standpoint of like just trying to like grow my hours or do, you know, thinking that way. It was always from like, how can I help the business leader solve these challenges? Or how can we, you know, because that, that was my background growing up. I, my parents had a retail business and I worked in the back office and on the POS and on the like customer service side for the internet. And so it was Dude, always like um, just applying that mindset. Your parents have like a big Halloween place, right? It's like the, is that? Yeah. It's like the, I don't know if you want to share that. I always thought that was fascinating. Like, no, that's cool. It's yeah, like no, it's really biggest... interesting. Growing up working in a Halloween, yeah, growing like... up in a Halloween store. It's a very well known store in New York City called Halloween Adventure. Uh, my parents no longer work there as of like this year. Oh, okay. They retired. But, but basically, like, it was but really it was, cool. Was because it like it was the biggest one in New York City or the biggest one in Brooklyn or something like that? Yeah, it was the most. It was like the, it was definitely the biggest one in New York, and it was like the most uh, world renowned, right? Like it was the most famous or well respected Halloween store in the world, and uh, you know from the industry perspective, in and a lot of like, celebrities world. came through there. And, Dude, that's insane. Yeah, I would say so. Like I'm sure there's some other remarkable ones, but like people came from all the world, and they're like, "This is the best looking, you know, Tony this is the best looking star I've ever seen." Like so, it was cool to that's to insane. to see that artistic vision. Yeah, and it was like a city block long, and it was cool, and so like <laughs> so you know, it was crazy. Like lines down the block t during Halloween and so that gave me a lot of uh, experience to like more of the anti-corporate uh just you know crazy business side business owner side of side of things yeah and so that was really interesting and so that's what I mean like that was a lot of my formative experience before I branched out and, and like stopped working there in my early 20s started family you know start growing as a person and so you know, flash forward to how that impacted how we run the agency, I would just say that's like the ethos I brought is the care and the mindset of the business. So it's been a lot of unlearning that and thinking about how to more look out for your own interests and like balance that, right? How you manage the time you're giving, how you manage the process of how you give the time, how you work with developers, you know, don't have very expensive meetings. And, you know, so I started reading some of that the Basecamp click books recently and like, you know, DHH and the how not to be crazy at work. And yeah. like, so I would just say it's been kind of like this reverse what, like, journey. What takeaways? An agency did, before. Yeah, dude. Like what I, I didn't read that book, uh, uh, how not to be crazy at work, but I heard a lot of good things about it. And I feel like there's a lot that I probably have in common with, with that already. But did you have any particular takeaways yeah. But I, I, like, I'm fascinated with that book, and I'm curious if you had any particular takeaways from it. I would say that I'm still in the process of like rereading and adopting it. But one thing that really stuck out at me is no martial language. So people equate business with war too much, gotcha. and that creates this perception of uh, anti-empathy. And I never really thought about it like that. Like, oh, the troops, the generals, the lieutenants, we got to go into battle, like all that stuff. Think about how that makes you feel, right? Meanwhile, there's real war going on that's terrible. Right. And, you know, people are losing their homes and lives across the world. And we're here, here comparing our mundane, relatively mundane e-commerce jobs and development jobs to war. Trying you know? to make so what sound that interesting. <laughs> Yeah. And so, for example, when I hear Magento Force is the new name of the community, I'm like, right, right, you know, right, force. right, right, right. Like, yeah, force is usually force is not always a good thing. Right. We Nobody wants to be forced. So so I would say that the martial language thing has helped us to stop talking a certain way, which creates that violent imagery. And that really brings a more um, consistent mindset. So I think that's cool because it turns down the pressure while still keeping you focused on what you have to do. And then uh, other, otherwise, it was the biggest things I'm taking away from there is also the asynchronous communication and how Slack is a go. gift and a curse, right? There I'm sure everyone yeah. could say that they love and hate Slack equally yep. as we all do, right? Because yep. it facilitates things that you couldn't do before, but also ruins Dude, everything. Sometimes. I want to do so. a whole entire series on just talking to people about Slack. What do you love about it? What do you hate yeah, about like, it? How do you use it? How do you not use it? I was talking to Eric and he was saying like they have a no DM policy for work related yes. stuff. And I was like, that, oh, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Like, I'm sure there's, it's like, yeah, Slack is such a big part of everybody's life uh, on so many levels these days, you know? Yeah. 
and and it often like is so it's like hard to like because in, in an office right this is where we go back to remote culture and how this is all impacted in an office you could literally go stand in front of someone and tap them on the shoulder right or you could go say hey let's go outside and talk for a minute if there's a conflict but on slack or in a remote world you have to create ways to get get your thoughts across to people without intruding on their work or their productivity and it's hard you know and so that's really one of the key learning things and so we use a jira by atlassian we use jira as our like ticketing system and like even from an ops perspective we're using it and so i would just say that like anything that can be done to keep people in sync while not creating these like blocking situations where now everyone's time is being wasted in your developers your managers, you know, everyone's, you're paying for that time, right? So people tried to really like uh, enlighten me to that because I, I went to like a, a collaborative middle school, right? Collabor- the New York City School for Collaborative Studies. And so the whole idea of group work and collaboration is is big with me, but at the same time, you can see how in, in the, you know, the cutthroat world of business, you gotta be able to like, and I see there's that martial language, right? Cutthroat. In the high pressure right. world of business, you know, you have to be able to like use your time wisely because the profit is there or, you know, there's always some kind of bottom line impact or whatever, right? The person didn't get their work done and for them, then they have to stay late. And how does that impact their life? And there's all these like interpersonal dynamics where we're all in our houses. And so it's like, or in wherever we work and it like, you know, there's a human cost that you don't have. Like when you leave the office every day, you leave it at work or, you know, you try to, but here it's like right there in your life. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, like, how are you feel right now about uh, like the Magento community, like as a like as an agency, as an independent agency, right? Like things are shifting right now and have been since the acquisition and things like that. Um, and you know, we talked a little bit about Shopify. Everybody's kind of diversifying to some extent to other platforms. Um, you know, how's that whole side of things going for you right now? How are you feeling about? Um, just the community as a whole right now? So I would say that we're living in a state where there's absolutely a transition. Magento 2 does not equal Magento 1 in terms of target audience, right? And in terms of cost of implementation and cost of maintenance. So that's been like the hard truth that's been kind of leaking out or becoming the fabric of existence over the last four years. I think at the beginning, everyone was really optimistic. It was just like, okay, like for like replacement, gonna jump into Magento 2 with the same fervor and energy. And I think where Magento and Adobe really made a mistake was where they tried to push everything to community engineering and didn't fix a ton of core bugs. Uh, The cost adds up because of that, at least the frustration, meaning like the agencies are forced to support and overcome core bugs, right? So you're paying to fix the product. And then at the same time, the customer's paying for that and they're not getting the same satisfaction or, you know, it takes longer to do something that was quicker before. So that creates a um, a more frustrating experience, right? So what does that mean? As Magento 1 is sunsetted, not everyone's moving to Magento 2, right? And also the whole upmarket shift, getting people away from community and the open source edition, they're trying to really funnel people to the paid product. And so I would say, this has led to a, a fracturing of the community where you have uh, long-term legends such as Vinay Cop moving away from Magento development. And that's out something that doing, I pay attention to. Out here doing ads for, uh, what was it, Shop? Uh, shop yeah, shop yeah more respect to him because you have to be passionate about what you're doing. And, and, if, and if something that you used to love isn't as easy or you, know, you can't facilitate it as much and get the joy out of it, that's part of it, right? And then from a business standpoint, just a lot of merchants don't want to pay those costs and you have to be a certain size to be able to use it. And so for my business, I would say that like the biggest thing is we have so much specialty in Magento that we're doing all these really cool complex use cases or people that want something custom and Magento is still really great for that. But at the same time, from just a pure cost standpoint, it's, it's, it's become really interesting. So from the community, I would just say it's, it's a shame to see some of the fracturing that's happened. And I just hope that, and now, especially with no events, right, it's harder even still to form that community mindset. So I would just say that, like, the trend I'm seeing is that either certain people are turning their focus, like you said, to big commerce or Shopify or diversifying their offerings because they have to, or it's just Magento has lost respect from certain corners or is not um, seen the same way. And that's always been 
really the perception, right? Because when Magento 1 was new, the PHP community was like, oh, this is bad, right? Because it's not following these conventions or it's, you know, it had, it had its bad reputation for a different reason, but now it's just become more like they kind of burn some of the people who helped make them great. And I would just say that that's a lost opportunity because you can be, I mean, once again, I don't know the big corporate business plans, but I'm saying you can be what you want to be and also help retain what made it special. And I think there's, that's kind of an art, an art form. And maybe there's no corporate job that like, you know, the director of making that specific thing happen. But I think that that's what people tried to capture about Magento versus like, say the Shopify ecosystem, they empowered their partners, but Shopify was like the, you don't need a dev but here's all these people we recommend anyway. And people built like an entire like cottage industry around Shopify, around Clavio, around certain specific uh, partner mindset, you know, marketing. And it was like basically very enabling the little guy. And so that just attracted a lot of people for the, for the you know, because it was such a, a lot of volume. Yeah. And so, and I would just say that's where it's different because you have these Shopify meetups in New York that I've been to, which are great. They're hosted by agencies. But at the same time, it was like, you notice a little more cultish behavior out of people that only support one platform very dogmatically. Yeah. And I'll never forget, I watched someone give a talk and then on their homepage of their website, it said they do Shopify and big commerce. And I asked, I was like, oh, so do you support any other platforms besides Shopify? And she straight up looked at the organizer and didn't, and like was mute, like wouldn't say, like wouldn't readily admit in a Shopify forum that they touch other platforms. So I found that to be kind of striking. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And Magento really never felt like a cult, right? Like, meaning, like, the only times I felt like a cult was when you would badmouth it on Twitter. Yeah, Yeah, no, especially when Magento 2 came out, the cult behavior was strong. Because if you said anything negative, like, damn you, Magento, for breaking this feature that worked great for 10 years or five years, now it doesn't work in Magento 2. And everyone's like, shh, stop it, stop it. You're making us look bad. And it's just like, there has to be a forum. And like, you know, and I always like honest conversation because yeah. otherwise the, the truth's going to come out anyway, right? About what's really going on with the platform. Yeah. So. I mean, I think um, all these platforms follow similar arcs uh, in the sense that, you know, they start out and they have a certain need for their partner ecosystem. And then as they get bigger, those needs change and the dynamics change and the uh, pricing models and incentives need to get tweaked. And then the partners that are driving the most business get prioritized and there's less likelihood to want to say something negative. Um, yeah. So, the, I mean, all those things are kind of just human nature on some level. Um, you know, people kind Absolutely. of responding to incentives and stuff like that. But, uh, it, it, yeah, it is it is kind of interesting to watch um, all the platforms evolve and stuff like that, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah. And I, mean, I always think like there's like a toolkit. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, 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 go ahead. No, I was just thinking it's like your toolbox, right? Like every, you know, like when you're known as like a web expert or someone that can help people with their business goals with using technology, that's like how we consider ourselves, you have to know who is a good fit for what. And so Magento has evolved to be a good fit for a certain segment. Shopify is the de facto leader in this segment, you know. Uh, Squarespace is the de facto leader in this segment or Wix or, you know, even smaller ones that are more like do it, grab and go. So I would just say that it's about knowing what's good for people and that might have shifted. And that's, and that's kind of, for me, the biggest evolution is that before when I said, I've said, sure, we could set you up Magento because we have a low cost way to do it. And that was way easier on, on Magento one. And especially with like hosts like Mage Mojo, where they helped cover a lot of the cost of supporting the application from a, 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 a systems perspective and like, you know, they were like an extra pair of hands for a reasonable price, how, is how I saw it. But like now with Magento 2, we've even exhausted some of those routes, right? Because it's it's more cost to maintain. So it's just kind of like an awakening if you've been working for it for a while where you wake up and you're like, okay, well, maybe I need to consider using Magento in these use cases. And then when these scenarios arise, we have to have a solution for this, this type of yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah, man. So speaking of solutions, man, what's some of the stuff that you guys have been working on? um as a company as far as sites or cool functionality that y'all have built okay so i would say in the last let's just say year right or in the last yeah nine to twelve months uh the most interesting projects we've worked on is uh we're working with a sustainable fashion brand which aims to create like a fully closed loop zero waste ecosystem and that's this company right four days 
And so how come you they said are, four days? Uh, how come you said four days? Is it for better days or that's the name of the company? Four days. Yeah. F O R D A Y S. Four days. Okay. Like we've got clothes for days, you know? Gotcha. And like so it's a cool brand founded by some successful fashion CEOs and uh they had this really cool dream to make it like fully closed loop. And what the unique hook about their brand is that anything you buy from them, you can return later, even if it's worn a hundred times and dirty for a credit. And then so you can buy the next piece of clothing and you're and you're basically encouraged to like use and abuse your clothes, but instead of throwing it in the garbage, you send it back for recycling and there's an incentive for that. And so That's cool. I think that is something cool and we see movements around that. And so to be a part of that and to to work with people that have that kind of vision and a very strong uh, idea of what they want and like the growth is always interesting. And then separately, there's like a luxury furniture retailer we work with and uh, they have a, uh, they had this really great idea to build a, a shop the room feature, which is used for product mapping. So it's not quite AR because for AR, you need really expensive models or the three kit software. And so this was a hybrid where it's using transparent PNGs but these spatial relationships are mapped out in the room to where it has that like uncanny valley where it still looks like the room. Mm -hmm. And then we made a React application that's fully integrated with Magento in an iframe and basically uses Magento product data, Magento models, but it's like this fully interactive experience where customers can like see how a product looks alongside other products and there's incentives to shop the room and that's called Groms. And so, that was really fun. And what made it exciting for me was that the business owner had had this vision for a while, had tried to find other companies to do it. And we came in as like a rescue party, right? Like they found us on LinkedIn and like basically we helped them launch the site. We helped them eventually bring this big vision to fruition. So that gave me a lot of um, comfort to know that we can take some idea that was really like planned out by somebody, but not in existence and make it a reality. And so like, that was cool because it's you know obviously React development and a hybrid of Magento. So that's cool. Awesome. So so and then the whole yeah. uh, so you're so you come to the site and then you can um, you, this is probably be easier for us looking at it, but <laughs> then you yeah. basically see like a 3D perspective. It's not actual augmented it's reality, not, but it's transparent yeah. PNG. So I go, I see a, I see a like a like a fashion showroom kind of a thing, and then I can, I can, sort of. I can. It's like. It's called shop the room, right? So they make, so there's two ways to do it. They yeah, make, they have pre-existing side. rooms they've made. Yeah, groms.com. They have these pre-existing rooms they've made. You click on shop the room, right? And so if you go to shop the room, then you like, so, and there's like three collections. You go on a collection and you pick a living room, a dining room, or a bedroom. And then there's what's known as position. So there's the bed position, the, you know, different parts of the room. And so the products are matched to those and you can swap out the product, select a new product, save it to your account. It generates a snapshot. You can share that with a friend and do, you know, show it to the person you're buying with or get a friend's opinion. And so it's that whole like type of interactive experience. And um, what's also cool about it is we also recently did some stuff where from the product page, and this was always a feature, but like from the product page, you know, when you're shopping the normal browsing experience, if the product is in a gallery, there's a button to go see that product in the gallery. And so it's also like trying to get people like if you're shopping normally, right, the normal land on landing page, go to product page, add to cart to give you one more step of the matching experience. And it's also been a really good communication tool for the brand to act as pseudo interior designers, right, because the customers trust their judgment as tastemakers. And it gives you some kind of visual framework to show how these pieces go together, even if it's like, what's the word, surreal, like it's not hyper realistic, but it's not not it doesn't you know it's a, it's a, it's kind of in that mixed world so it's it's kind of interesting to do that in an age when vr and ar is where it's at so i feel like this could iterate in the future towards ar but I, this is a unique experience and it works so i think it's it's really cool, Dude, it's I'm, cool checking it, I'm checking it out right now so do you drag the products in or do you just do no you have to you click on you can click on the spot if you're on desktop you can click on the actual like location like click on the bed It'll pop up the bed spot. You can select other beds. Gotcha. And uh, it was funny. It was funny because uh, you know a big a big industry leader came out with a similar thing while we were working on this. So that kind of validated. Oh wow, you know it validated. And they've only done like let's just say a V1. This is a little more fleshed out. But the point is, is there's uh, there's definitely something to this experience. That's, That's all. Cool. You know, and like that you can 
get some value out of it. Obviously, like any piece of software, you can iterate, make the user experience better, but it's really cool. Very proud of it. Really cool like experience for us. That's awesome, man. It's uh, whenever you're yeah. getting furniture, dude, it's all like visualizing it is like the name of the game, you know? It's like always so exactly. hard to know. Exactly. Yeah, it's always so hard to know what's going to fit where. Um, that's cool, man. Yeah, and obviously like Ikea and stuff is doing like full AR room view or Home Depot, right? If, if you ever if use the Home Depot yeah. app, you can see how this little like tool looks sitting on your counter and it's like weird. Like, yeah, it's fun to dude. play with, but it's not always accurate. Yeah, when I was yeah. building this little uh, shed, there was this, um, uh, there's a, an app called SketchUp, Google SketchUp. Yeah. And it's what does the, the 3D. 3D design. And then you can do a, an AR visualization, um, you know, wherever you want. So I was able to do that. So you can place your shed yeah. in your backyard. Yeah. Like, like this yeah. is how it would look on your property next to the hydrangeas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, but um, well, that's cool, man. Um, like, yeah. I know we were talking a little bit about like, as far as like business models that are COVID friendly, you know, and like, we, you were talking about how there's a lot of stuff closing, you know, restaurants and things like that being impacted. Um, and, but like, it's interesting to see some of the business models that kind of work for obviously e-commerce in general um, works, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's sort of what's supplying contactless everybody, delivery. contactless delivery, yep. everybody's moving over to remote to e-commerce more heavily than they did in the past. Um, what are what are some of the I don't know what are some of the things you're seeing as far as the types of businesses that are doing well in the current economy the type maybe the types of clients that you see companies, doing well yeah so companies that everyone thought were losers their stock price has skyrocketed right like Wayfair who everybody hated on is now grown right over so it's interesting to see how big businesses have benefited from this because they were kind of had the infrastructure in place and. You know, now nobody wants to go to a store. Here we are, right? It's like a, a big depot of things. So I feel like those mega companies online are doing really well. And then from a smaller business perspective, it just really forced every business to confront their contingency plans and their and where they were on the continuum of going online. And so that whole offline to online movement that Karen Baker was working on that kind of started was like a good a good notion because that's in essence what happened is everybody to confront their plans. And so I'm saying, like, really, I'm trying to think of businesses that really don't work online are the ones where you need to physically touch somebody or do something, right? Like a spa. You can't have a digital spa experience or, a, or like, a hair, you know, haircuts. Dude, like, I'm dying anything to like use that. the sauna, man. I, this, that's the thing that I – I used to go to the sauna every day in the gym and, like, yeah, now, I'm dying. Yeah, now your pores go uncleansed except <laughs> by the Texas sun. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I feel you, man. And like, and so, and I, I mean, I want to, yeah, exactly. The thought of joining a gym, but actually that's all right. So interesting story. Uh, a friend of mine has a virtual training business. He had an in-home personal training business where they would go to your house with the equipment, basically personal trainer come to your house and work you out. Right. Yeah. Obviously their business was completely Im immediately impacted by COVID, but then they found a way to transfer into zoom and have like a coaching app where you can track your progress and all this value added stuff. Yeah. And like, and obviously it allowed him to expand his business because now it's not just a local business. He can hire trainers nationally and he started to take off. So I would say that it, certain lines of business that had, you know, like they adapted in a really ingenuous, you know, ingenious way, sorry, not ingenuous, but an ingenious way to like adapt to the conditions and thrived. And so I think you're going to see a lot of stuff like that where, you know, people who may not have been comfortable doing certain things before are now willing to accept new ways of doing things into their comfort zone. And there are people who stand to profit from it. And then, you know, from what I know, the industries that are hurting the most are obviously the restaurant industry and in-store retail because just the cost of opening the doors just can't be met. And so, yeah, that's kind of sad and we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen there. And so like that is still to be determined. Right. And, uh, and so it's kind of like, it's kind of like an abyss. Like, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I hope that, you know, either it becomes safer for people to engage in those activities just so that like, you know, people's like long-term professions aren't hurt, but from an e-commerce standpoint, I think what we're seeing is just more comfort, like which is this is good as for small businesses too, is that like 
now to support your local business, you have to shop online. Before it was like to support your local business, go shop locally. But now if I order from a local business online, I'm doing the same thing, right? Yeah. So I think it's become more uh, socially encouraged to do that. And yeah. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of companies get real creative um, and just, you know, figuring stuff out, you know, on the fly, um, which is cool, you know, cool to see. Um, we were talking about the drive-in theaters a little bit. Like I was, I, like, I literally did some research on it, dude. Cause I was like, dude, how cool would it be to start a drive-in theater, you know? And I was like, uh, I bet it's not that expensive. Cause you get some, like, I don't know you, I was like, you rent out some space and, uh, and then you just, mm -hmm. you bring a screen and some speakers and you're done. Yeah. And then you got to pay licensing fees, I'm sure. But like. I started looking into it, man, and like trying to figure it out. And then, um, it's, uh, it's actually really expensive. It's like, I think it's like 250 grand for some reason. I don't even know why the star one, the star one, like yeah. that was the net cost. Yeah. I don't even uh, understand, probably, yeah, I don't even land, understand why, insurance, like insurance, equipment. I'm sure it all adds up, but like, um, but yeah. And then, and then, you know, it's like, there's some different drive-in things. Like you were saying, Metallica is going to do a drive-in concert or something like that. And, uh, there's comedians doing drive-in stuff. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm also interested in all the virtual stuff, like you know the game Fortnite, how they had like a Travis Scott concert in the video game. Oh yeah, and, that's like, crazy. Steve Aoki concert, and it was wild. Dude, man. virtual so reality think, is gonna change everything once it hits yeah. mass scale. Yeah, I love it. I, I've I've wanted, I've had the dream to build like a VR e-commerce for like ever since like 2015, 2016. I like couldn't stop thinking about it, and then like you know how I would do it and all that. And like the point is, is though it's like it's really interesting because once people try it, they really are convinced, right? Like I first tried it, you know, where you put the cardboard on your eyes with the cell phone, and I didn't get nauseous, and it was just like, wow, this is really crazy. So I have never really used an HTC Vive for more than 10 minutes, or like a you know, or one of the good ones. But like they're really mind blowing, and yeah. so what I'm saying is that you could potentially go to the drive-through in your house, right? Like you get certain, you know, those experiences might even transcend why go somewhere unless it like really adds value. Because that's what I was thinking about the Metallica concert is if it's going to be coming out of your speakers, like most drive-throughs, I don't think they have big speakers. They have right. you tune into a station on your car's radio or the Bluetooth or something. It's literally, or, you know, you get on a network. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm saying like I'm gonna go here to see this big screen, but then it's playing out of my car and everyone's car at the same time, or not. I don't know, right? So I think that's kind of the jury's out on that. But it, in, I, I've been to one drive-through in my life, and it was a cool experience when I was a kid, right? Like you know, it definitely is something uh, to, to to share the experience with our baby yeah. boomer families, right? Like, like, I totally to see what wanted, that's like. Yeah, I totally want to take my kids to a drive-through, like drive-in. I don't think it's we've experience. done. I think I don't think we've done that at least that I can remember recently. So I'm sure they'd have a blast, yeah. you know? Exactly. It's at least something you got to do once. And I think, uh, if especially, I just think the movie industry is not committed to it because it's not scalable, right? Like they'd rather just beam Mulan into your house because how many people are going to go see it at the drive through It's hard to do that, especially like in, depending what season it is, right? Yeah. So I think drive throughs are, I hope to see things like that expand, but I don't know how, you know, I don't know. You probably did more for like, what was your forecast? Like, what did you find was going to be I like, mean, I know it was a cool idea. Like, are people, did you see that people are doing it successfully now? Or what was the, your take on it? I mean, there's a whole, like, there's a whole like industry of like, you just like we're in the Magento industry. There's a whole industry of people that do drive in theaters or car washes or like specific types of businesses. So mm -hmm. I, I found a couple of posts from those types of people. And, and it's like, I mean, they've been doing this forever. They're going to be doing it forever. It's just like its own industry. And then, um, yeah, that was kind of where I landed on. It's just like, it costs what, like, like my thing was like, why couldn't you start one for like 20 grand? I felt yeah, I feel like, like the plywood driving. Hell theater, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Dude. Plywood driving theater, man. For like 20 grand, get a big old yeah, just with a projector <laughs> straight up, dude, like piece of cake. Yeah. And then I was like, it just seemed like, you know, and then, and then this is the thing, like any kind of a real world business, right? Like me and you have businesses that are internet based, right? But like a real world business, like you got to have insurance, you got to deal yep. with zoning codes on the Property land and casualty. make sure it's like zoning. Yep. zoned right. And I was just like, ah, like, 
if I could find somebody to deal with all that and it, and, and if we could, tr- if we yeah, could, like proto- if we could prototype something for like 20 grand, I think I would do it. Like it's, it, it would be dope. So what like, if you be sell, cool. what if you sell drive through in a box? Like what if you're the drive through <laughs> evangelist and you create a kit? For people to start their neighborhood cul-de-sac drive-through, yeah, you know, that, that's, like, that's, what if there's a way to like that's probably the evangelize more, drive-through. Yeah, that's probably the more scalable model. But to me, it just feels like it'd be dope to be like, yeah, I have a like, I have a drive-in. I theater. own a drive-through. I, I own a yeah. drive-in theater, like, but not just to own it, but also to create that for your local community as like a place mm-hmm. where people could go and just have have a good time. Like it just yeah like it, the indie cinema yeah it just feels like it'd be just a cool like local community based thing to create, um, but ultimately all the just red tape and stuff like you could compare it to all those movie nights in the park that a lot of communities do right where people come sit on some lawn and yeah. watch a movie yeah 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 so it's like in essence that's what it is that's right all it just, is like yeah it's just with your car yeah I don't see how it could be oh and then when I looked into the pricing for licensing the movies i'm pretty sure it was something That's insane right. like 50 percent five oh um of your ticket sales go but isn't there like a minimum i don't think they're just gonna give it to you if you're selling a thousand dollars worth of ticket you there, know like, there's probably a minimum like, too but i thought it was crazy like i like it for like i figured like 20 percent felt right you know but like 50 mm-hmm. percent um it might even be higher than that. It was it was high. It was like higher than it should be, you know. And now we know why all the independent <laughs> theaters went bankrupt, right? Yeah. Like, now you know. Yeah, that's a tough business. Like, it sucks because there's something magical about going to the movies, but mm-hmm. at the same time, my dad time, loves the movie. Yeah, but at the same time, like, you know, n- n- nobody's going as much as they used to, you know. Yeah. So. Unless you're like, unless it's like in your like routine already right like you go after work or it's like part of something you do with people like it definitely was on its way out yeah. to begin with but still successful yeah you know. yeah 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 that that's an area of where you really have to be comfortable sitting in, in an enclosed space with people now so it's the same thing right ventilation social distancing like have you ever been to like a 4d theater where the, like the seats move that was cool like nah. i saw like star wars and I think that there's still a place in the world for that. Literally, there was water squirting on you from the back of the chair and fog and the seats shake. So like when Hulk That's is getting insane. punched in the face by Thor, your seat like goes with you. It was like really wild, right? So like that's, that's called 4DX. Uh, and, and that was – that's fun a few times. Like I saw – you know, you see a big movie like that, like Avengers or Star Wars or something. Like, yeah. So I feel like there's still some novelty left once we get back into experiences that you can have in any close yeah i mean and and things like that make more sense because they're higher ticket you know they're like Mm -hmm. they're they're more uh more distanced right more socially distanced it just seems like as a business model it's probably easier to sustain that type of thing yeah it's more of a premium thing so people are willing to pay for it versus if it's just a regular Mm -hmm. movie like i'll just watch it at home on my big screen you know, on Netflix. Yeah, you got to use gas. You got to do it. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, people like, may find it a hassle. To you got to have the whole, gym. like, you, you got to have the whole nine yards to make it worthwhile to to go to the theater. You know, you got to. I mean, people on rollerblades in the drive through delivering drinks and popcorn. You need, the, you need that. Totally, dude. Yeah. Although I was thinking, because that's another layer of complexity if you have people that have to serve food. So I was thinking, forget mm-hmm. all that no serving food, no food at all, bring your own snacks. And then we don't have to worry about it because if you serve food, you serve alcohol. Now you got to get an alcohol license. Now you got to da, 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 so da, like, da. tail, Caitlin's tailgate and drive through drive in, like <laughs> yeah. it's a drive in and a tailgate. Every yeah. Time. We keep it simple. Keep it simple. You know, but um, that's the, what I like about it is you could still have a bunch of cars, but people could still be hanging out around their car as long as they're not, you know, that you could still have, interesting like the parking lot at the football game experience yeah somehow yeah the movie yeah That'd be cool yeah there's got to be some ways to recreate some of those things you know um but uh but anyway we're about at our time here sir anything we missed anything we want to get in before we uh before we wrap, this, wrap this baby up yeah we need something like controversial and hot topic we need oh, something like that that's sounds, animated that sounds dangerous or we need like a rapid not something like politically i mean like something like a uh 
you know, like a um, what's the word? Like something that's very like a rapid uh, fire. Yeah, like rapid fire or animated. Because we talked about the hack. We didn't talk about Gary V. We talked about drive-ins. We talked about the agency. We talked about the community. Talked about New York. So yeah, we just really didn't cover uh, Gary V or anything else. So yeah, you know, up to you. Man. Yeah, I'm a big. I, I'm a big. Head of the dog. I'm a big Gary V fan. For some reason, I thought I remembered seeing a picture of you with him, but I totally imagined that. But uh, you know, he's out in New York. You're out in New York. Um, I haven't been following his stuff too much recently. But uh, but I know he did uh, acquire the e-commerce agency, rebranded as Vayner Commerce, which is which is yeah. a, which well, is interesting, um, interesting move. And they it, focus on Shopify Plus, I want to say exclusively. Yeah. Um, well, it's growth. Yeah, it's growth marketing. And we we want to actually collaborate on a project, in like in an auxiliary way with them. And I thought that was cool. Like we were doing really? a project for like a 360 degree camera brand where we were moving them from like some Django Python to Magento and uh, they were owned or funded by the same venture capitalist firm that was related to VaynerMedia. And then it was right before Black Friday and VaynerMedia popped up and they were like, hey, we have this new product page and all this stuff we want what? you to do. So you're like, and we like turned VaynerMedia it around and stuff like that. Yeah, there were some people from VaynerMedia. So I was like, cool, man, we went toe to toe with the Titans. Like we were able to what? support this and that was something that was a, a cool moment as like a small brand and i knew who he was and i was like oh man like i want to i didn't know they're doing e-commerce like let me quit my job and go work for them like <laughs> at the time it was like 2017 you know it was like way back in the day but i'm saying like so i i think that's cool and yeah he's an impressive force man like once again it's what you get out of it right if you if anyone could be like a cult of personality but i like that he preached a lot of like the personal responsibility and like you yeah. know don't complain and like taking responsibility for your life. And I think as you know, a lot of people go through struggles in their teens and twenties and like understanding who they are. And like, that's a big thing is acceptance of that stuff, but not letting it hold you back. And, uh, you know, I think that there's this whole other hustle, hustle culture and some of the stuff that that's, what's controversial about him is the fact that, you know, Oh, it's all just your circumstances. And no matter what you can make it, if you were, you know, there's a lot of luck or there's a lot of other things involved not everybody can make it because otherwise everyone would be doing it so i would just say that like overall with gary v he's a fascinating person and he's like been able to like take that a lot of also the hip-hop culture right you see him interviewing rappers and, and younger celebrities and connecting with the audience and like it really speaks to people because that's what people care about is how did you get successful or how are you going to continue to be successful yeah and i think he's really good at that and like the way of empathy and empathy right empathy is his whole motto and i think that's important dude i was at my buddy's house recently and uh they were showing me some of their wine and they had some of the empathy wines which is his wine brand and i was yeah. like yo you got the gary v wine and they were like what and i was like empathy yeah, we... wines it's gary v's wine they're like oh we didn't know what this was we got it as a like as a gift as like a Interesting. like a housewarming gift or something like that i was like oh dude yeah and he's also in e-commerce and stuff too so i was like yeah that's like i was like all pumped about it um yeah they just sold to constellation brands did you know that in july apparently I didn't know this that. has been the article i read yesterday about him yeah it got bought for an undisclosed figure by constellation brands which i think is budweiser and corona like constellation brands is a big one really that's interesting yeah, constellation I brands wouldn't have, i wouldn't is, have seen him selling traded. i wouldn't have seen him selling that because like he always talks about how he wants to acquire brands or build brands and then just take them, take them up, you know, just like to the all the way to being able to buy the jets, you know. So I'm surprised. Yeah, so maybe this was a, that's what the article said was like maybe he got some money that helps him on the way. You couldn't know, have obviously, been that much though. It could maybe have been, they made an offer he couldn't refuse. I don't know. It's hard to imagine it was that that much. Like, I don't what's know. What's your t what's your estimate? Hundred million? Less I mean, than a hundred million? Yeah, I feel like it would have to be like I mean, because he already has a pretty pretty decent amount of money. It's it's hard to imagine it. that it was like like I feel like he could have probably I don't know could he have taken that up to the billions I don't know maybe I feel like he would have gotten that thing to be huge before he would have sold it because it's only like what a yeah, few well, years old isn't it isn't it like what two three years old yeah but I just think maybe a lot of the growth is tied to his personal brand and like you know maybe he said hey this hit a peak value or I don't know you know because he's a wine lord by trade right that's how he became famous yeah and made his money was 
his family's wine business. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's why I thought Maybe he was, was gonna, a moment of pride. That's why I thought he was going to hold that for life, like because it was so strongly identified with like his story and his what's you know meaningful to him and stuff like that. So, but I'm sure he made. I'm sure he made the right move at the end of the day. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of relate, right? You sold businesses before, sold, like sold a thing or two. It's I all. Can <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we all hope that, and and that's also another interesting thing is like. Have you spoken to agency owners like Mediotype or like certain companies that have been bought by bigger companies? Because that's a trend even in our industry, right? Like I never, because when I, I always thought of business because like I said, the background of the retail and like the, the helping, you know, the, the people, the people mindset, it was like, I want to do good business. But some people's sole purpose is to build the company, grow it and sell it. They're not in it for the, the long, like longevity. They're doing it for a different reason. And that's like a whole strategy that I feel like is worth exploring for people because you don't, you know, that's, it's just another, you know, it's just a, another concept. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I kind of feel like, um, at this point with where the Magento ecosystem is at and the Adobe partner ecosystem, a lot of com you know, a lot of Magento agencies are getting acquired by essentially by Adobe partners. Cause to be an Adobe partner, you gotta be at a whole different level. Um, so I mean, it's happening a ton, you know? It almost makes me feel like, like yeah, it almost makes me think that's kind of the move right now. Um, but, or if you're not going to do that, then you're going to go multi-platform and start to really focus on other platforms as well. Or you're just going to have a nice little niche within Magento. There's a ton of, I think, little niches that are still going to work for independent companies. Um, you know, but at the higher level of the, uh, at the higher level of the partnership scale, like the Magento partnership scale, it feels like they're probably all going to be acquired, you know, on some level. Yeah. And that's what's interesting, right, is the recruiting game is still strong. There's still all these recruiters on LinkedIn. And, like, I always try to flip it on them. Like, hey, we, you know, we can help them. We're an agency, but we're different. Like, why don't you introduce us to them? Like, you know, so it's like there's opportunities. It's just not every company. It's like how do you enter the matchmaking arena or how do you get matched up with it? Because – if there, as long as there's companies using Magento, there's a need for Magento developers. That will never go away, yeah. right? Like as long as there's businesses transacting and making money using Magento, that means somewhere, somehow, there's somebody who needs this, your service. Yeah. And if that amount of service providers contracts, well, then that creates opportunities, right? Yeah. So it's it's still an interesting time. It's just there's no, I feel like there's no nexus, right? Like Commerce Hero is a really good nexus for talent. But like, there's no like nexus in like marketplace of ideas solely around Magento besides say Twitter. And I think that's what the association is trying to do is create more of that conversation. But it would be cool if like, you know, that's what Imagine did every year was at least create this like match the spark, you know, a spark for everybody in each local event. And so I don't know, we got to figure out how to keep that up because there's no, you know, otherwise it's just going to blend into the background or it's all happening in places where not everyone can see it. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, um, I mean, hopefully by 2021, things will fire back up, but it's hard to say. Um, and, and what do you think is the next big way for people to connect besides Slack, right? You know how there's like, for example, I found about a Slack community called Revenue Genius or Rev, Rev Genius or something. It started by this guy named Jared Robin, who was like, and it's like 3,000 sales professionals. And so people are still starting all these communities. But like you know how there's is been the Magento Slack. Genius? There's all these Slack. Or something like that. Marketing. No, that's something else. That's another this one. This is this is called Rev Rev something. Rev yeah, Rev Genius. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe it's inspired by Marketing Genius, but it's called Rev Genius. But my point is that like you have these communities popping up of thousands of people, but like for example, the Magento one, you started it, right, a long time ago. And now there's Mage Slack, but then there's also community engineering but like what's another way like i mean this may be something that hasn't been invented yet but how do you create these massive connections and like form the you know just yeah. centralize it yeah um that's a good question man especially I when the main brand isn't interested in doing that <laughs> <laughs> you know isn't that's not their core focus yeah like shopify stewards that because that's part of their cult but the, you know for adobe it's a different type of thing but they're still software users what's the main community yeah, for shopify is it like a slack or well, no, I just mean in the sense that they have their events, they have their Unite, they have their day with Shopify. Like they have these, it's basically all filtered through oh, their brand. Oh, you're saying so, now that- Like there's a, ne like Shopify itself is the nexus. Yeah, you're saying now that Imagine got, got 
fold it into Adobe's event. Yeah, or just the fact that because there's a fractured product, right? Like in the sense that there's multiple streams going on and not all of them are priority. So it's like that doesn't mean those people aren't there versus like Shopify is like very tied to one idea. Even if there's Shopify Plus, it's still Shopify, right? I mean, so it's like Yeah, but I feel like I feel like that's a that's an example of being you could say fractured because like the Shopify Plus user is a totally different user from the Shopify um, mm-hmm. small business starter. Right. Um, so I feel like mm-hmm. though, and, and then you have agencies that are just Shopify Plus. My buddy's building a product that's just Shopify Plus subscription stuff. So I feel like as as again as these platforms evolve, they kind of all go through these same dynamics where they start to segment out. There, you've got the more enterprise customer, you've got the middle True. and the small. Like big commerce. So yeah, so on some level, I feel like they have those same dynamics, but I don't know as much about that community. I think um, yeah, you know, Magento has similar things, right? There's like the real enterprisey people there's the real open source there's like the magento one for life people <laughs> you know yeah and stuff like that and yeah. uh yeah i mean on some level social media ties it all together but there's there's little subgroups part of me feels like there's there's got to be some kind of a magical community software that just like helps people build community i mean slack is cool uh discourse is cool for forums magento forums facebook is cool groups. facebook groups are cool but I feel like there has to be something that that that's maybe that's better for just for building community, um, but that's just the software. And then on top of the software, you got the actual people, the actual networks. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I feel like there's something there for. There's got to be basically there's got to be something better than Slack for online communities. Yeah, and because and I feel like there's a lot of beacons. Beacons. Yeah, like meaning like Marcus Schuss beacon right he's a beacon about certain topics and you have you know like different people are different topics but like are like the people you go to or have their own group of followers around specific segments and it'd be cool if there was like some who's who of that or some way to like tie that together because then you know like once again stack exchange the forums like there's still so many different areas to get information from and it's like when you add it all up it is a really active and vibrant scene you know yeah yeah, for sure. So it's like, how do we unite those beacons? Because it's all there. It's just there's no direct, you know, and then what's a directory, right? Like the certifications directory is folding into the Adobe thing. And that's more about certified developers. So like, where is the like place of Magento that's not just, you know, that isn't that isn't like branded just, you know, that isn't focused on just the main company mindset, right? Like as in there, because it's a, open source community, there has to be a way to like unite people a little better. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe it's already happened and you just got to go find it. Don't know. I mean, no, I think you're going, I like where you're going with that. It's something that I, I, I do think about from time to time. Um, yeah. So we'll have to dig in and in, into that more soon. <laughs> um, yes. Well, listen, thank you. Thanks man. Appreciate having you. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in and where can, uh, where can people find you online? Okay. So I'm on Twitter at, Mayer B, M-A-I-E-R-B. Uh, we are on Instagram at, at Bemeyer LLC. We're on Twitter, uh, Bemeyer.com, B-E-M-E-I-R.com. And we're there and we're available and uh, love to talk. So thanks for awesome. the opportunity to be on and and talk and have a conversation for the world. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, good, good to have All you. Right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll see you soon.